Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Brett Fairbairn, and together with my colleague uh, Murray Fulton, both of us are faculty members here at the university. We're really pleased to be here today to answer questions that you might have and to uh, say a word or two about the Rhodes Scholarships. Um, we're, uh, now, we didn't do any of the work to organize this no. session. I want to make that entirely clear. Uh, the organizing, the publicity, and importantly, the pizza that's available afterwards are all courtesy of the university's uh, scholarship and awards office. Um, so we're here really just to share information and share what we know. And what this is about is your questions and what you're interested in. So we're going to speak for uh, a very, very short period of time. Um, and we'll, we're going to leave lots of time for questions and for responding to what, uh, what you have to say. Um, so I thought I'd maybe begin with some really basic information about the Rhodes Scholarships and then turn it over to Murray to talk for a bit about um, the experience of being a Rhodes Scholarship, you know, of being a Rhodes Scholar in Oxford and what that's about. Um, I should mention that uh, the reason for the camera and the microphones is I gather there were a number of inquiries from students who can't attend today and who wanted to be able to get a sense of the information we're going to cover. Um, so we agreed that this could be taped and recorded. And one of the things that Murray and I will try to do when you ask questions uh, is to repeat the questions into the microphone so it can be part of the recording. Um, the other housekeeping thing is information. Uh, this is the worldwide um, um, web address for the Rhodes Scholarship and for information about it. Um, it's a good place to look up. Um, and there, uh, somewhere on that site, there is also a copy of the information that's specific to Canada. Um, and this is Murray's email address and mine, in case you want to get in touch with us uh, directly. Um, so with that, um, I jotted down just um, uh, five things that I think are um, key uh, very simple points of information about the Rhodes Scholarships. Um, so the Rhodes Scholarship, first of all, is a prestigious scholarship. It's more than a century old, and it enables uh, young people to study at the University of Oxford in England. Little tiny footnote to that. It's also possible, I believe, for people to study at the London School of Economics, um, but it's primarily to study at the University of Oxford in England. Um, so point number two, there are 88 of these scholarships awarded in the world each year. There are 11 of those that are awarded in Canada. So if you do a bit of quick math in your head about the population of different countries in the world, I think you'll conclude that Canada is actually well represented among the population of Rhodes Scholars. However, and one of the reasons for this information session, there have in recent years been too few applicants uh, from the province of Saskatchewan. And that isn't just something that uh, Murray and I think, it's actually a comment that's come back from the selection committees. So knowing that Saskatchewan people are as bright and talented as anyone else, um, engage in leadership in the community and in organizations, there should be a greater number of applications from this province than there have been. That's one reason why it's wonderful to see so many people turning out for a meeting like this. Uh, point number three, the purpose of the scholarships as described by the trust, it's a nonprofit charity that's responsible for them, is to support people uh, who will esteem the performance of public duties as their highest aim. So to esteem the performance of public duties as the highest aim is what the people who select these scholarships are looking for. Um, and I suppose, um, uh, fourth, when they apply those, uh, that uh, sort of standard, the selection criteria for this particular scholarship combines several different things. They're described on the website, but I would sort of loosely generalize it as being about academic excellence. So it's, uh, it's about uh, really uh, top performance in academic subjects and academic averages, letters of reference, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I think on that basis, many of you received an invitation to be here today. But second, it's about the applicant's commitment to society, to improving the world, um, to really demonstrating that public duties will be their highest aim. And you might have lots of questions about how you demonstrate that as a scholarship applicant. Um, the only thing I'll say at this point is that there are a very wide variety of people who qualify and are selected for these scholarships. There's no one path. 
Um, so fifth and finally, uh, the reason to seek one of these scholarships, there may be many reasons. Uh, you might like the climate in England, you might like old buildings, there might be lots of reasons that would uh, uh, interest you. But the one that I think is the most important is if you seek to contribute to society, this is a scholarship that enables you to do that. So those are my five points. And Murray, do you want to add a word about what it's like to be a Rhodes Scholar and the experience in Oxford? I, I sure do. Thanks, Brett. Um, let me just start off by saying um, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is a, a, a marvelous turnout. Uh, we did, uh, we've been doing these um, a little sort of on and off over the last few years, and this is by far the best um, attendance. Um, so um, this is actually wonderful to see this many um, students um, out and, and having um, an interest in the in the roads. Um, Brett and I, um, by the way, Brett and I are both um, road scholars. Um, I was um, elected, um, went up in the fall of 1978, and you 81. went up in 81. Um, so um, part of um, and, 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 we'll, and by the um, way, we'll, no, no one who is eligible for the scholarship today would have been born when we received that, one. So yes, anyway, like we'll not even that. close. Um, um, we will, uh, some things have changed at Oxford since uh, Brett and I were there, and we'll talk about um, some of those changes. Um, and um, some of that will come out in your questioning. Um, but um, we were just actually at an event where the warden of Rhodes House, so this is the, uh, the person that's looking after the trust and um, um, really kind of oversees the students when they're at Oxford, um, he was just through Saskatoon here um, a couple of weeks ago. And um, in, in part, this meeting is a, is a reflection of that because he was really urging, he says, you know, we're not getting enough um, um, applicants, both from, I mean, both from Canada generally, but, but specifically from this province. And, um, what, and, and in particular, we're not getting enough um, applicants from the University of Saskatchewan. We are getting some applicants um, that did their um, grew up here, did their high school, for instance, in Saskatoon or Regina, um, other, other parts in the province, but usually Saskatoon and Regina, and then went off to um, a McGill or um, um, Harvard or a Yale or whatever, and then apply back here um, as a Saskatchewan resident. Um, but we're not getting enough, um, um, and that's fine, and that's great, uh, but we're not getting enough U of S um, uh, applicants. And uh, I really hope that um, some of you um, take the time and um, put the effort into um, to applying. Um, and we'll try to give you some idea of, of what that um, entails, um, what you actually have to do to, um, you know, um, be successful. Um, just a little bit uh, um, about what it's like, what, you, what would you do if you're at Oxford? Um, the first thing, if you're chosen, um, if you happen to be um, one of the, the, the people that's chosen for a scholarship, the very first thing that they'll actually ask you is, um, which college do you want to go at, it, go into? Now, colleges are not the same as colleges here. Um, our colleges are, are based on subject matter, um, agriculture, arts and science, engineering, um, uh, business. Um, colleges there are um, groups of scholars, um, students, um, living in, a, in a, their, their small, relatively small groups, um, living, um, I mean, the, the classical college is um, a quad or two quads, um, so there'll be four walls, um, dorm rooms all around of the quad looking out into the middle. The, the, the quad will be grassed. Um, um, you know, sometimes they're playing croquet there um, in the spring or um, um, summer. Um, but that college will um, contain um, tutors, I mean, I'll, and I can talk a little bit about the tutors in just a moment. Um, but they'll also have um, a dining hall. Um, in some cases, they'll have a chapel. They'll have a pub. Um, they'll have um, a, a series of sporting teams. Um, I was on the rowing team. In fact, I ended up being the captain of the boat club um, for the, the time that I was um, at my college. Um, I was at a college called Exeter. Um, Brett was at a college called New College. Um, there's, a, there's rugby clubs, there's um, drama clubs, there's tennis clubs, there's um, you name it. Um, there is a club um, usually within the college, um, but occasionally for some of the groups it'll be a, um, campus um, or university-wide. Um, but much of your life goes on in the college. 
Um, and this is where you eat, um, you know, sleep. Um, uh, by the second year, many of, of the students then move out and, and are living elsewhere um, outside of college, but they're still associated with the college. Um, and um, um, there are, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, there are 38 different colleges um, at the University of Oxford. Um, and that's the first thing that you have to do is figure out which college um, you would um, go into. Um, now, you also, and this is actually part of the application process, um, you actually have to indicate something about what um, program you're going to study. Um, and I think in the past, this was even before Brett and I went through, um, you could be kind of um, a bit laissez-faire about what you wanted to do. Um, you just say, um, I want to go to Oxford, I'm, I'm going to do, um, usually you would say, I'm just going to go and do an undergrad degree and um, you could show up and you could even change um, your plans um, kind of halfway through. That really is no longer the case. Um, at the, the selection committees are paying a great deal of attention to what people are putting down um, in terms of what they want to do. Um, and so if you are interested in applying, what you need to do is get onto the Oxford um, University website and take a look at their courses. Um, and just to give you a, a, a broad idea, there, I mean, this is like any university, there are undergraduate courses and graduate courses. For the roads, though, this is a, a, um, an interesting sort of, um, sort of distinction. Historically, um, up until, what, Brett, maybe the mid-90s, early 90s, yeah. um, the roads, there was a kind of unwritten rule that Rhodes scholars would typically go into an undergrad program. Um, there were exceptions, and Brett, Brett was one of them. He went into a graduate program. Um, I went through um, in an undergraduate program. I did a second undergraduate degree at Oxford. And that was actually quite common. Um, and that still is open. Um, if you are interested in changing your, um, your you know, direction of study a little bit, um, in my case, I went through in the agricultural economics department here, and then I ended up going to Oxford and doing um, one of the, the sort of classic undergrad programs at Oxford called Politics. Um, philosophy and Economics, or PPE. And um, I, I wanted to do that because I really hadn't taken anything in political science and philosophy. Um, and that gave me a chance to expand my um, sort of um, area of, of, um, of expertise. Um, so one can certainly go and do undergrad um, degree, but you have to have a very specific reason why you want to do an undergrad degree. Um, just sort of, if you've done history and you want to go back and do history again, um, the committee would probably say, um, we're not sure that that's the right reason. Um, you really do need to um, um, have, have worked this out. Um, right now, um, and, and Brett and I can't remember the exact number, but it's, it's well over half of the scholars are now taking graduate degrees. Um, and there are many, many, many graduate degrees at Oxford, many, many more than when Brett and I were there. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I actually went through the, the, uh, the list this afternoon. Um, you have both taught courses and research-based courses at the graduate degree, at the graduate level. Um, there are things called Masters of Studies. There are Masters of Science by, um, uh, by coursework. The Masters of Studies are also course-based. There's something called an MPhil. Um, if you're in the business area, there's an MBA. In public policy, there's something called the MPA. Uh, there's a Bachelor of Common Law or the BCL. Um, and there's about three or four more that I didn't, met, uh, didn't bother taking down. That's all on the taught side. And each of those, if you take, say, the Master of Science by coursework or the Master of Studies, each of those will have a, a list as long as my arm of the subject areas in which you could work. So everything from anthropology to um, comparative politics to um, comparative social work to um, um, you know, international development to sustainability um, to economics, uh, you name it, um, it's there. Um, and you have to really start to figure out what you um, might want to, um, to do. 
One of the things that's, that's starting to occur, and you, you can watch for this, I'm not suggesting that this is a good idea uh, or not. Um, it, it depends on you. Um, but certainly, as I'm sitting on the selection committee, what I'm seeing are students taking one-year graduate degrees, and there's an, a number of them um, at Oxford, and combining them um, and saying, um, over the two years that I'm going to be at Oxford, I'm going to do um, program A first in my first year, and then I'm going to switch and do program B. And then they have it worked out. They have some kind of rationale for why that would be the case. Um, and there, there, there are also research degrees um, at Oxford. Those are the ones I was just talking about are course-based, um, and then there are um, research degrees. And um, these sort of are basically of two sorts. There's a master's degree, a master of science, um, and a DPhil, and the DPhil is essentially the, the, the PhD. Um, and that's um, what Brett did. So let me just stop there. Um, because those are the two main decisions that you have to make. What program are you going into and what college? Um, why don't we open it up and you can ask um, Brett and I about um, anything you want to know about Oxford, the roads, the application process, uh, what you should be putting into your application, et cetera. So let's open it up. You know, Murray, you mentioned the quads at Oxford. My brother-in-law has quads on the farm, too, but it's not quite the same thing. Uh, yes? Um, absolutely. So the, the value of the scholarship is set um, to... Um, um, I think it pays your fees directly so that you don't even see the fees. It also pays a living stipend and one airfare to England and one airfare home. Um, so it's actually quite a generous scholarship. Um, certainly when, uh, when I did this, and I suppose costs have changed a bit, but when I did this, um, I was able to, uh, to do that without, uh, without debt, that essentially the scholarship covered everything. Was that your experience yeah, as well? Yeah, that was my experience as well. Um, it, it, you're right, it's got much more expensive, um, particularly because the um, UK government increased tuition um, to Oxford. Um, and um, uh, so uh, Oxford ha has, is now charging um, all the, the scholars much more than they used to, so that's actually taking quite a hit. Um, and uh, there's all kinds of things we can tell you about um, the finances of the Rhodes Trust. Uh, and then I saw one question back there, and then this one. Yes. Yeah, so the so, question so is uh, whether um, uh, um, you have to have an undergraduate degree before you apply, or if you're pursuing an undergraduate degree at the time you apply, is that okay? Um, so what we're looking, what the... Um, what the selection committee, I think, is looking at these days, um, if you're in your fourth year um, and you are a, a about to graduate, so um, the um, just so everybody knows um, the deadline. Brett, you probably just looked at this or somebody. It's um, October. I did write it down. So the deadline to apply is the 16th of October this year. Right. So um, you'd have to have your application in by the 16th of October. Um, the committee meets very, very shortly after that, takes a look at all of the applications. Um, typically, the last few years, we've been getting across Western Canada, the prairies, and there's three scholarships from the three prairie provinces. Uh, we've been getting something like, oh, 90 to 120 applications. Um, and we um, have to, we, we do a first cut through that um, and get it down um, to... Um, to ten, nine or ten, um, and we interview um, all of those um, nine or ten um, individuals. Um, and that takes place roughly the third week in November. Um, and so um, if you're thinking about this fall, third week in November, if you're a student that's going to be then um, graduating next spring uh, with a four-year degree, um, you'd be fine. Um, the committee would look at you um, as being a fully uh, fledged um, um, applicant, um, completely qualified. Um, if you're 
looking at a three-year program um, and graduating, um, the committee would probably think that that's a little um, light. Um, and we are certain, and we certainly get uh, people that have applied after they've finished their degree. Um, we get people applying um, sometimes um, twice, and in some cases even three times. Um, and in fact, there's a, there, um, there's a scholar from Saskatchewan um, back in, what, the late 80s, um, who um, didn't make it until his third um, try. Um, and um, lo and behold, he, um, he did it, and he's now um, a very, very successful uh, partner in um, McKinsey and Company. Um, um, I know another one that took three tries and became a uh, professor of um, Arabic language and Islamic studies. Yeah. So there's been uh, there's been a couple. Yeah. So uh, just on on the prerequisite issue, I don't think, but uh, but on the case of uh, of requirements like that, do do check the website information. I don't think there's a formal requirement for an undergraduate degree, but what the committees are concerned about uh, is to know that the people they select have what it takes to succeed academically at Oxford. So that's what they have in mind. So they would. They'd even look at your grades in individual courses, how many courses have you taken at a senior level, and there's a, there's a judgment involved in that. But what they're trying to avoid is the unfortunate experience of people going to Oxford and then uh, just not enjoying and not thriving in the academic environment. So they're wanting to know that you're sufficiently well prepared and that's more on their mind than any specific um, uh, um, explicit requirement. Does that help with the question? Okay, so one here and then one there. Um, so the question is, if you were interested in something specific, and the example is a Master of Fine Arts, how would you find out whether there are the faculty um, um, at a particular college in Oxford um, to support what you want to do? Yeah. Mm, good question. Do you want me to ask um, you this? <laughs> yeah, um, you know, here's where I think you need to um, probably lean on some of your professors um, and see if they know of people that have um, connections and do they know somebody that knows somebody or do they know somebody directly? Um, the, what, what can I say from the, from the point of view of the selection committee? Um, we're not, interestingly, we're not that interested whether you've got it down, um, you know, I want to work with Professor um, X and Y. Um, that actually for the selection committee doesn't mean very much because we don't know, select, you know, Professor X or, or, or Y. Um, you may need to have that kind of detail to be able to say, this is what I want to do. Um, but uh, don't feel that you need to, in your um, letter, um, have, you know, specify all that detail. The, the more important thing is, why do you want to do um, a Master of Fine Arts? Um, what area roughly would you specialize in, and why is Oxford the place to do that? One of the things I might add is that part of the scholarship application is a personal statement where you talk about um, uh, what you have done, what you aim to do um, using the opportunity of a Rhodes Scholarship. And that's one of the places where you have an opportunity to make clear why um, a Master of Fine Arts uh, program or whatever it might be is something you're not only well prepared to do, but something that um, will give you an opportunity to make a difference of some kind. Um, so that's, uh, I, I think, one way to kind of construct the argument. And, and yeah, it has to hang together. It has to be something you could do at Oxford for sure. That's part of the definition of the scholarship. But as Murray says, the committee isn't so much thinking about you know, who will supervise it down to that level of detail. It is probably true with any graduate degree that you would apply for at any university uh, that it would be a good idea to check out online uh, which uh, scholars there are uh, publishing, in the case of fine arts, are uh, uh, creating or performing um, in that field. But, uh, but I think the, the, the internet's a pretty good source of information for that. And yes, it was back there. Uh, 
Uh, yes, you are, as long as you meet the age criteria. Uh, so yes, you are eligible to apply if you have a, a graduate degree already. Uh, but it's important to pay attention to the age criterion for this scholarship because that's one of the only things in the selection process um, that isn't a matter of judgment at all. It's uh, rigidly specified in the criteria. So by, I think it's October 1st in the year you arrive in Oxford, you have to be at that point in time between 19 and 25 years old. Um, so if your 25th birthday will have happened before the 1st of October in the year you'd be in Oxford, then um, you'd be out on the basis of age. So that's the requirement that uh, creates the biggest difficulty for graduate students just because of the time involved. Yes? Correct. Is that also on like uh, IRL rules aside or? Oh yes, so in order to be, uh, so the question is whether you have to be a Canadian citizen or permanent resident, whether that's a hard and fast rule. Um, so the answer is yes, that's a hard and fast rule in order to be selected in Canada. But there are also uh, Rhodes Scholarships being awarded in many other countries in the world. And I think most recently, I think China was added, but historically there's Germany, there's um, uh, South Africa, there's um, Australia. Um, Australia, there's India. Uh, so there's a long list of countries where scholarships are offered. Um, and of course they each have their own um, uh, national selection criteria. But people who are um, um, uh, citizens uh, or re permanent residents of those countries have the option then of going for a different scholarship. Yes. Um, yes, so the question is um, if you um, graduated um, and then stayed um, and then didn't apply right away, um, would you still be eligible, but you still are um, under 25, would you still be eligible to apply? Um, the answer is yes, um, and there are, um, we do get applicants uh, that do that. Um, I, think, I think it is fair to say that um, what you would need to do in that kind of situation is you have to say something about that gap um, and what you were doing in that gap. Um, and you'd really have to have, um, I think, used that gap um, to, um, you know, Brett talked about um, showing um, that you wanted to make a difference in the world. And I think you really would need to have shown that you used those two years um, in some very profound way um, to do that. Um, and in, in which case it could actually be a very big plus um, if, if, if in fact that, um, that was the case up to an application. One of the interesting things, I'll uh, get to the question in a minute, one of the interesting things about a Rhodes Scholarship is um, the, the, uh, um, the breadth of the opportunities uh, to make your case as an applicant. Um, so there are successful scholars um, whose uh, applications have been strengthened because they had performed at a very high level in music. Um, or in uh, competitive sports, or in many, many possible fields. Um, and the committees uh, respect um, uh, that kind of demonstrated excellence in uh, something. And the scholarship doesn't uh, prescribe what it is. Uh, but if you spent that two years doing something of that kind, then that certainly is understood to be an asset to the, uh, to the application. And uh, yes, the question back there. So how long is the personal statement? Murray has served most recently on the selection committee, you might remember. I'm, I'm trying to remember. Um, is there a, has anybody checked? Is there a word limit? Uh, yeah. You know, I'm thinking there must be because the ones yeah. I saw were all about the same length. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, what's the word limit? I think it's a thousand words. A thousand words. Sounds about right. Yeah, I would have said three-ish pages. So yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, yes, in the middle here.
Ooh, so are, if you're of two nationalities, could you simultaneously apply with two committees? Um, that's a question that goes beyond my domain of knowledge. Mine too. <laughs> um, so for that, um, for that, you need to check uh, not with, uh, with us who know a bit about the experience of being scholars. You need to check with the secretary of the, the, um, of the uh, regional selection committee. So that information should be on the website. It, it, it is Do we have a Saskatchewan secretary still? So uh, it's, it's a regional. It, yeah, no, there is a Saskatchewan. Oh, no, sorry. There is a regional um, secretary uh, in it. Turns out that he's in Saskatchewan. So this is uh, Bill um, uh, Johnson. Bill Johnson. Yeah. So Bill Johnson. Um, or William Johnson. William Johnson is yes, uh, who's located in Regina, is the secretary for um, the uh, regional selection committee, and he'd be the best one to direct that question to. Um, so, uh, can you only apply where your residence address is? Yeah. So there's there's more than one way of determining which jurisdiction you can apply within. So it's where you're normally resident, or it's where you're currently attending um, an educational institution. There may be more to it than that, yeah. but there's more than one way to qualify. So for instance, um, somebody that's at Harvard um, can apply from, in, from the prairies, even though they're, they're living um, and are in residence um, at Harvard. Or, or they could apply in Massachusetts or, or, they could or the apply northeastern in US. Um, yeah. In, um, in yeah. Now, so it, um, that would only, they could only apply apply in uh, Massachusetts if they were American citizen, um, I suspect. So, I um, suspect that's right. Yeah. Yes. But, but do, let me just, let me just uh, give you an example that does work. Um, suppose that there's somebody from Saskatchewan that's at McGill. Um, they could choose to either apply through the Quebec um, competition or they could apply through the Prairie competition if they were from, say, Saskatchewan. Yep, so two questions, so more about uh, uh, what differentiates colleges and how do you choose among them, and could you apply for a one-year program? Do you want to tackle either of those? I'll start with colleges, maybe. Sure. Um, so a college in the Oxford system is a community of students and scholars, and they do differ somewhat in their character and expertise. Um, so I think you'll discover that uh, St. Anthony's is a college that's only for students who are doing graduate degrees. Um, there's some colleges that are better known, say, for medicine. Or, uh, so there, there are some patterns, um, but for the most part, um, you can study any subject at any college. And the way it works uh, within the Oxford system is that if there isn't a tutor in your college that has the, the expertise necessary to teach you the subject that you need, then a tutor will be arranged from a different college. So you actually study across the university, but you're based in, in principle and as much as possible in your home college. Um, so it, um, uh, it does allow you to kind of spread out that, uh, um, uh, the sourcing, I suppose, of the, uh, the expertise. Uh, there's also a number of research centers uh, within Oxford that enrich studies university-wide. So when I was there, I was doing history and the, uh, um, the modern German history that I did was associated with um, the uh, Institute of European Studies, modern Japanese history with the Nissan Institute of Japanese Studies. So then in fields like that, you'd typically be studying with someone where it would be a coincidence if they were from the same college you were from. So, um, when uh, students get together at Oxford and talk about the differences between colleges, um, uh, two of the topics that uh, frequently crop up are the quality of the accommodations and the quality of the food. 
um, and the colleges do vary quite a bit in those regards. Um, so colleges um, um, uh, may uh, have new student housing, they may house greater percentages of their students within their walls, or they may have more uh, flats that are distributed around the city. Um, when I was there, and my knowledge will now be decades out of date, but as I recall, Merton had the best food. Um, uh, uh, Teddy Hall, which is St. Edmund Hall, was right up there. Um, I don't know that New College or Exeter won awards on the food no, side. No, they did not. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's some, and some of it then will be the, the luck of the draw. But what you can find out uh, from the internet sites of the college is a little bit about the character and feel of the place, like how big, what's the scale. Um, so you should know that there is a long-time historical connection with Exeter College. Um, a lot of Saskatchewan scholars going back about 50 or 60 years have gone to Exeter College. I did not, but as you heard, Murray did. And because of that, that's one of the reasons there is an Exeter room in Marquis Hall here on campus. It's one of the reasons there's a Saskatchewan room in Exeter College in Oxford. So there's, and Exeter is a small, uh, relatively intimate college, yep. I think would be a yes. way to characterize it. So that's one, one thing. New College, where I went, um, is a relatively large college. The undergraduate population has a high proportion of British students. Um, as a grad student, I had a more international mix. Um, the most inspiring thing about New College uh, was the architecture. So it's called New College because it was founded in 1379, and that's new, or was then. <laughs> Um, so very, uh, very fine uh, buildings. And um, Christchurch College, um, you would recognize if you've watched Harry Potter films, that's where they used the staircase and the hall, the dining hall. Um, so yeah, um, uh, you know, there's no, uh, there's no hard and fast criterion. The one, one thing that should be mentioned though um, is that gaining admission to a college is a prerequisite for gaining admission to the university. So if you can't find a college that will take you, you can't join the university. It's, um, um, it, it, uh, it's a kind of a federated system where the colleges are the bedrock of the university. Um, and for that reason, there's a little bit of strategy. I think they probably still ask you to list several choices for so. colleges. So if, you, if you're listing three choices or whatever the number is for colleges you want to attend, don't take a really prestigious big college like Christchurch and put them third because the admissions person at Christchurch will look at that and say, they don't really want to be here. They put us third. Um, so put, you know, aim, if you're aiming high, put the, uh, the, the most challenging option first. So that's one little tip, I guess, that I came across. Yeah. Um, I don't have much more to offer on, on that first question, but you can, any of you can follow up. Um, let's move to the second one, which was, um, I think you said, you asked about, um, uh, you said, could I just go for one year um, and do a one-year program? Um, I, my comment, uh, and this is really coming from sitting on the um, selection committee, um, a selection committee would probably not give an application like that very good grades. Um, we, um, this, we, the committee thinks, um, and, and, and so do I personally, this is, a, this is a tremendous opportunity. Um, and to go for one year, you really do not really even begin to understand Oxford. And I mean, I think it's fair to say, um, even after two years, you have just barely, barely, barely scratched the surface of this um, immensely old and complex institution. Um, and going for one year, frankly, isn't worth it. Um, if you're gonna go, you gotta go for at least two years. Um, and you've got to, immerse yourself into, um, in, into this. I, I think the one thing that, I, I think the Rhodes House um, really is looking for are students that will really embrace the Oxford experience. Um, this is, you're going to Oxford as much for the Oxford experience as you are um, for the academics. The academics are stellar, um, they are, um, uh, they are every bit as good as you can imagine uh, that they are. Um, but in a way, um, you're, you're, and, and this goes back to a comment that Brett made earlier. What the, the uh, selection committee is looking for is our students that can go to Oxford and they can handle the academics part without having to sort of worry too much about getting it right. Um, not that you don't have to work. Um, don't, don't think that I'm, that's what I'm saying. 
um, you know, you have to, it still requires a great, great deal of work, but that you're in no danger of sort of coming up short on the academic front, so that you then are free um, to do all the other things that Oxford has to um, offer, whether it's rowing, uh, whether it's playing cricket, whether it's, um, uh, you know, acting in, 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 in the play um, that your college is putting on. Um, um, all of these other aspects are um, that is as much about Oxford as um, the academics. Uh, yes, there and then here. Uh, ah. So what sorts of extracurricular activities did we do volunteer work before applying? Um, so in my case, um, I was the, um, I suppose mainly it was that I was the president of the USSU uh, before I applied for the Oxford Scholarship. Um, so that's one thing that, uh, that often occurs is that people have been involved in formal student associations. Um, um, but it varies. There's, a, there's no, uh, certainly no one template. Yeah. Um, so in, in my case, I was also involved in um, the student body. This was the, the uh, College of Agriculture Students Association. I was quite heavily involved in that. Um, I think today, um, so just a couple of, of, of comments. Um, today, there's a different, um, there's a, I was going to say, and I think this is still the right way, there's a different, um, I was going to say standard, but that's not quite the, the right way to put it. There's a different marking um, that's going on. There's a different kind of expectation um, of people's involvement. Um, and I think sort of sorting that out is, is, is critical. Um, there's many, many more opportunities for I I involvement in in volunteer activities and so forth, um, I think, today than there was um, back um, in, in our um, time. But, but here you have to be careful because, um, in fact, we were talking about this with the warden here a, a few weeks ago. Um, one of the things that, and I think this is particularly true of Canadian selection committees, and it's certainly true of the one from the prairies, is that we're very, very much on the lookout for people that have gone off and um, done their three, um, three weeks or a month or four weeks or six weeks um, overseas um, in um, this, um, doing this development project or that development project. Um, and um, by the way, we see a lot of that coming through on the applications, that people have gone off um, as maybe part of a course that they've gone off to do, or maybe it's in their summer holidays they went for... Uh, they went to um, you know um, sub-Saharan Africa for um, for six weeks and um, and did X, and one of the things that we're doing is constantly trying to evaluate how the, the best word I can come up is how real is that? Um, mm -hmm. Is this just um, something that somebody that somebody's purchasing um, in an attempt to try to show oh I've got that credential, or is it something that they've really um, worked at and experienced. Um, so one of the people, one of the people, um, one of the, I, I remember one of the uh, candidates from a few years ago, um, it was very, very clear that her experience in Africa wasn't just something that, that she bought. It was real. Um, she was there, she caught malaria, she um, lived with people in, in, in their village um, in a way that um, was ob obviously um, something that, that was deeply ingrained in her um, but you read other people's um, statements and you're pretty sure that um, this was their first time um, sort of, um, you know, on a plane. Um, and the committee's pretty good at sort of watching for that kind of thing. So this doesn't really help you other than to say, if you're going to make a deal out of a, uh, out of a volunteer activity, make sure that it's something that you can really say, yes, um, I've done that. That's the standard today. That wasn't, this, this, that wasn't when Brett and I were going through. It was a different um, set of, um, of, of measures. But today, you really have to um, be able to say, yeah, um, whatever it is. And it doesn't have to be going halfway around the world. Um, it can be um, working um, with a group here um, in the city but if you're doing it in a really meaningful way and it's really clear that it's, it's connected up and that you can show how it connects to other things that you're doing, um, that'll work just, 
just fine. Yeah, and maybe just to expand on that, um, you know, I remember um, uh, applicants who had uh, volunteered in nursing homes, uh, worked with people with disabilities, worked in homeless shelters. Um, uh, so just the um, um, uh, started community-oriented uh, small businesses, um, uh, environmental projects. So just about anything you can imagine. There's no field that qualifies you better than, than another, uh, provided it's about that sort of public service uh, principle. Um, however, what the committees are looking for uh, is a sign that you're passionate and committed. Um, so if it's something that you only started two months before the application deadline, They'll, they'll wonder about that. But your personal statement is actually where you have an opportunity to tie that all together. Uh, so to communicate your passion and your commitment for that activity, I guess I should have mentioned music and sports yeah. and other things in there, but to communicate your passion for that activity, what you've given to others, and how it relates to what you propose to do at Oxford and what you propose to do afterwards. Um, so you have an opportunity to tie it together. Um, and it's, it's maybe the unique thing about this scholarship, that there's no restriction by, by subject or, uh, or any of that. It really is uh, more uh, what you can demonstrate that passion and commitment about. Are there letters of ah, good. Letters of reference, academic or extracurricular. Okay. Um, so there are some guidelines, I think, in the application um, um, instructions, and you should follow those pretty um, clearly. So uh, they, uh, uh, and I can't remember them exactly. Do you remember them? There, there are six, yes. Um, that sounds right. Um, did you, what did you say, four? Yeah, so I think that that's right. I think there's, there's, there are six letters of, rec of reference that you have, uh, four from, uh, at least four from academe, from you know, uh, people that have supervised you or have taught you. Um, I would probably go with four, with those four, um, and then try to find two others um, that um, you can sort of um, illustrate th this um, these other dimensions of your character, this passion that, uh, and commitment that Brett was talking about. And interestingly, those people will often be able to do a better job of that um, than um, your profs, uh, mm -hmm. because they, they've seen you at work um, in, um, that, um, in that association or wherever. Um, let me just say a little bit about, the, about what you should be asking your your refer referees for in letters of reference. Yeah, very good. Um, and um, I want Brett to comment on this as well. Um, I would say that um, one of the things that, one of the most critical parts of your application, if you decide to apply, will be those letters of reference. And one of the things that, that is, um, th that's, in some, way, in some cases, it's actually discouraging, um, where you get, um, uh, you get, you'll get a series of letters from um, for an, an applicant, and these are not well-written letters of reference. It's not that the candidate's not good, it's that the letters of reference aren't good. Um, and what these letters of reference have done is taken a probably very good candidate and actually moved them down. Um, and there are, of course, other cases where the letters of reference have moved a candidate up, okay? Um, and um, what you need to know is that some people write better letters of reference than others, okay? And it, you, won't, you won't have run into this, because um, I've talked to enough students that I know that this is not something that you guys um, sort of think about. But you actually need to do a little bit of interviewing, I think, on your own, and talk to your referee and find out what kind of letter of reference he or she is going to write for you. So make sure that it's going to be a positive one. But also, what, what we're looking for when we're on the selection committee is we're looking for something better than, than you know, Sally is a great student. Um, we want we want that letter to be able to demonstrate that and to give examples um, and to show she's a great student because, um, you know, her insight in this particular course was 
um, you know, phenomenal because she, you know, was able to pick out this um, element, um, whereas most of my students weren't able to do that. Um, these kinds of um, sh sort of showing um, how um, the person um, fits the particular criteria that is being discussed. Mm -hmm. So how that passion is, is, is shown, um, how um, their excellence in writing or their, um, their ability to be able to um, analyze, um, you know, vast amounts of material, et cetera, whatever, whatever that is, you need to find referees that are good at communicating that rather than just saying, you know, she's good at communicating vast amounts of material. That's going to go over like a lead balloon. Yeah, so in terms of letters of reference, um, I, I agree with that. So yeah, um, all, all else being equal. So think about four academic and two that testify to leadership or personal qualities or community contributions or whatever, uh, whatever it may be in your case. Um, but also remember that, uh, so this isn't like uh, most job applications where the letters of reference are almost a formality and they're simply an opportunity for someone to raise a red flag. This is a place where the committee will read every word of every letter and where they're an essential part of your application. Um, so one of the things to think about is how do the different parts of your application fit together? Your transcript to your courses, your personal statement, your letters of reference, how do those speak to each other? And sometimes, not always, and it isn't always needed and it isn't always for everybody, but sometimes you can find a referee or two who help put what you do into a context. Um, so an example my, that I have seen might be, you know, this, uh, this student uh, um, came um, out with, uh, with a 75% average, not terribly high, uh, but the referee was able to say, you know, this is what that means at our place, and this is why um, I believe this person has the intellectual background and ability to succeed at Oxford. And oh, by the way, I know that because I've been at Oxford myself so I can directly make that comparison. So those are all things that make the letter stronger and make it more meaningful because it's part of a, of a package. Um, so yeah, four, four academic and two, uh, two other or personal um, are, is a good guideline. Uh, but do think about whether you know people who have that opportunity to put what you've done in a context and say um, what it means and what it shows about you as a person beyond what will be in your statement in your transcript. Yes. Uh, let's say you found a program you wanted to apply to at Oxford, but it was like for four years instead of the two years. Would you be able to apply to that and then just uh, use the scholarship for the first couple of years and then just take over after it expires? Um, yeah, so can you apply for a program that's longer than the two years that the scholarship normally supports? Um, so Murray may have more recent knowledge than, than I do. Um, the, uh, it's probably a good idea to look for what you can do within two years. Um, um, I actually ended up doing a DPhil program that took longer um, and ended up uh, patching together uh, funding from a variety of sources to support um, uh, my final uh, years as a student there. Um, I guess what I noticed in doing that, and this was 30-odd um, um, uh, years ago, uh, what I noticed in doing that was that uh, um, uh, all the people I dealt with in my college and at Rhodes House were very concerned about that. They would really hate to see someone uh, fail to complete their program because the money runs out. Um, so they, um, I think it would, it would be um, a difficult selection uh, to select a, a candidate where the money might run out before their program's done over another candidate where it's a surer bet. Um. What I, would, um, what I would suggest in that um, case, so the, the, the programs are gonna take four years are, are typically DPhils. Um, and um, one, of the, one of the things that's actually very common is to do a, a, an MPhil um, or a Master of Science um, with uh, research and then transfer into the DPhil. Um, and so if, if, if I was in your shoes, what I would do is apply on the basis of doing a D fill, uh, sorry, an M fill or a Master of Science, and say this is. But my goal is, if I um, am successful and I do really well in these, and if I have funding, I would then look at staying on. Um, but make it so that it is, um, it, it does cut off at um, at two years. Um, committees would be actually very, very, um, you know, picking up on what Brett said. 
Uh, committees like that kind of thing because it shows that you're, um, you're, you're planning. Um, you, mm -hmm. you understand the, um, the constraints that are in place um, and you're working within them to try to make something. Um, that, and that's a good signal. So I know this wire that's on my ear keeps making me feel like my head is tugged this way, so I'm neglecting my <laughs> right field of vision. And there was a question over here. Um, in regards to personal references, non-academic references, should it all be from people who are in leadership or supervisory roles over you? Or if you have a particular coworker who you think has seen a lot of your best um, work in the working world or something like that, should you ask them to put in a reference for you as well? Uh, great question. So for, for non-academic references, does it have to be someone who has supervised you, or could it be, say, a coworker who's uh, observed what uh, what you've contributed? Do you want to go with this? Yeah, good. This is tricky. Um, I think you know, maybe this is just me. Um, I think, the, but I think the committee doesn't put a lot of weight on coworkers. Um, and, and the reason there that there's always this bit of a sense that um, maybe this is just a, um, a friend. Um, and by the way, we've, we've also got, um, we've got letters of reference from um, people that are obviously really good friends of the candidate. Um, and those don't um, go over very well. Um, they, um, for, for a couple of reasons. One is that they're often, um, it's quite often that they're not as well written um, and they're not emphasizing the right kinds of things. Um, and then secondly, there's always this question about sort of a conflict of interest that, that, that pops up. Um, so, um, you know, generally I would stay away from, um, from that, try to find somebody that's, that is in a, a, a bit more of a leadership role. Um, partly because what, what we're looking for um, is a commentary on the candidate's leadership ability um, and ability to be able to do something bigger than just um, a, a, a small job. Um, and so you need somebody that can, that can comment on that. But um, there are always exceptions. And if, if there was exactly the right person, um, then sometimes it works. Um, you know, I think I'd give a slightly different answer. Um, uh, you know, I have seen when I was on the committee um, uh, a, a fair number of weak letters uh, from people who were clearly personal friends, family friends, or co-workers. And what made them weak was not necessarily um, that the committee discounted them because of who they came from. What made them weak is just because they really were weak letters. They were thin. They didn't say very much. Um, they didn't provide a lot of evidence. And I think what's going on there is, on the one hand, uh, someone who's a, a personal friend uh, will not uh, uh, often have that sort of um, um, objectivity or perspective um, uh, to evaluate what you've done and compare it to others. And I think that hinders the ability of a person to write a good letter. So I think what I'd say is, is think about that standard of who can put what you've done in context and compare it to what others have done. So obviously, many people who are in leadership roles can do that because that is part of the function of a leadership role is to do exactly that. It may be that there is a coworker who for some reason is able to do that, um, in which case I would, I would, uh, would consider it. But yep. for me, it's about being able to make that comparison and make it persuasive for a committee. Um, the other thing, and, and uh, Brett makes a good point, um, I was thinking more about a coworker that's, you know, relatively, um, you know, the, uh, the same age. Um, um, so, if you have so a coworker that's obviously in a different age um, category that, uh, than you are, um, that helps. Um, and a personal friend um, that say is, um, um, you know, they may be in their, um, you know, uh, they may be well established in their career, and they, but they happen to be a personal friend of the family and have, have, have observed you, um, say, growing up. Um, some of those um, have been very, very powerful. Um, and, but again, uh, Brett's right, it's their ability to be able to be a bit removed um, from it and, and actually be able to provide some really um, good commentary. At the back. Well, you know, I, I guess I'd, so is there any reason why students over 25 don't qualify? Um, so I don't know that I can answer that uh, in a present day context. 
Um, I guess I'd say it's, uh, it's historically uh, determined and it's part of the terms of the trust. Um, so there's, uh, there's minimal ability um, uh, at this point in time for anyone to do anything about it. Um, so I, I mean, we could speculate about what the reasons were when it was done, but the main point is that it's entrenched as a term of the, of the, uh, of the trust fund. Murray, do you have anything to add on that? Um, no, I mean, um, Brett's right. Now, elements of the trust have been changed. Um, the mm -hmm. trust started off um, and um, the scholarships were not open to women. Um, that changed in the 19, 1970s. Mm -hmm. um, so elements have, of, the, of, of the trust have changed. This is one, um, I, I think there is a sense, um, you know, I said earlier that, well, I think there's two, there's two elements. One is that um, if you opened it up and you moved to say to 27 or 30 or something like that, you would um, increase the number of applicants um, substantially. And I well, think- Well, and, and handicap the ones who are 18 to 21. That, that's right. right. Um, and, um, and I think that there is, I think that's probably why people haven't moved um, to do that is um, there is a sense that they want this to be a scholarship for sort of younger people. Um, and uh, they want people in this period of their life. Um, you know, an, an interesting sort of uh, trivia point about the scholarships, the, uh, the trust funds are uh, governed by the will of the benefactor. Um, and of course, the benefactor being dead 100 years ago can't, can't change those terms uh, uh, himself. Um, so every change requires an act of the Parliament of Great Britain. Um, and so there are changes, and they have been modernized, uh, but it's a cumbersome process. Yeah. There was another... There was another hand. Yeah, there's another one up here, but go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so in the case where uh, someone has um, uh, worked for a professor on campus, um, so the professor was the employer, uh, but then they write a reference. So is that an academic reference or a non-academic reference? Do you want to go with this one? Or oh, should boy. I? <laughs> go ahead. Um, so I would say it depends on the letter they write. Um, so in particular, though, most faculty members I know, if you worked for them, say, as a research assistant or a teaching assistant, um, they would talk about your skills at communication. They'd talk about your ability uh, to uh, have knowledge of the material and to master it. Um, and they would end up commenting on things that are really quite academic in character. And I've seen references like that. Um, so if it's, if it's evaluating the quality of the work you did uh, as, uh, as a research or teaching assistant, uh, something like that, I can totally see that having the weight of an academic reference. But on the other hand, if what the person writes uh, is that, you know, you were punctual and you were always there on time, and, and I mean, it's not going to have the academic weight to it, right? No. Um, I, I would add the same thing. Um, you know, if, if you were working with them, um, and I'm just picking something, I'm just making this up, I have no idea what the specifics are, but I can imagine where you would work for somebody and you might be doing this work um, off campus um, or um, in, in an international um, arena. And what they could be commenting on are your leadership abilities, um, your, um, you know, the, the, the things that you're doing, the way that you interact with a, a group of people, um, the compassion that you showed to the people that you're dealing with, um, all things that you wouldn't expect an academic reference to supply, then I think you would put it in the category of a non-academic. On the other hand, if it was really just talking about the, the research that you did and the teaching that you did, um, I would put it in the academic um, group, even though you didn't specifically take a class from them. Yes? Uh, can engineering students apply? Can engineering students apply? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's no restriction by, uh, by field. Um, you know, one, uh, um, I suppose, uh, general um, uh, observation I'd make or maybe advice that I'd give to candidates 
is the more, the more technical the subject of study that uh, you have been doing, um, and, uh, and there's aspects of engineering that are not technical. There's lots of other subjects that are also technical, so it's not about engineering specifically. But the more technical your studies have been, uh, the more carefully you need to think about how you use your personal statement and about that, that business of, uh, you know, aiming to make a, a public contribution to have an impact on society and how you aim to do that. Um, so it's not, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not a handicap, it's just something to think about. And it's part of that same advice of to think about the, uh, the impression that's made by the whole body of materials that you have. But the fact that you're in engineering uh, is not um, a, a hindrance or a, a disqualification. Um, the, the grades you get there are, uh, are uh, great grades that count in favor of your application. Uh, but just think about the totality of what you present to the committee. Um, and I, let me just add that, in fact, there is, not, there is no subject matter on campus that um, is um, off limits. So. Correct. Else. So you'll have got the impression, I think, from all of this, and you, a lot of your questions were about exploring the different dimensions and criteria and weighting of things in the scholarship, how things are considered. Um, this, this in some ways is one of the most wide open scholarships there is. There, there, it's re there's really not much more to say about the, uh, the, the overall idea other than um, uh, high academic ability and this, this uh, um, uh, promise, this demonstrated commitment to contribute uh, publicly to society. Um, and there's a million different ways uh, that uh, people can make that case, and we've seen it on the committees. Um, the committees, by the way, are um, uh, relatively large and multifaceted. Um, they include a mixture of people who have been Rhodes Scholars and people who have not. Um, so it's not dominated by any one group, and people from many different backgrounds. Um, so it's, um, uh, the, uh, my experience has certainly been uh, that they have uh, been looking to appreciate the strengths of every candidate and to, uh, to see the best in what comes in front of them. Um, if, if there's no other questions, let me just say what I said it right at the very beginning. Um, I really um, hope that uh, a number of you um, put the effort in this fall and um, apply. Um, that would be wonderful um, to, uh, uh, to, that would be wonderful to see. I'm not on the committee this year, um, so um, I won't be reading um, your applications. Um, but- um, Nor am I. Um, nor is Brett. Um, but um, please, uh, if you have some questions um, that uh, you, you know, you really, um, you've got something you want to just sort of talk over about um, some aspect of the application, please feel free to um, give us um, a shout, drop us a, an email and we'd be happy to um, respond. And maybe one, one just uh, a closing, closing thought. Um, you know, don't, uh, don't, um, don't discount yourself too much. I mean, I, I think that's a common failing of, uh, of uh, let's say, a prairie culture that people are, are often humble. Um, uh, we don't like to, uh, to toot our own horns and all of that. Um, and I'm not saying you have to do the opposite, uh, but it's good to give something a try, uh, even if you're not, uh, not sure about it. Um, in the case of these scholarships, I want to reinforce something Murray said. Um, um, there are people who have applied for them and been turned down and applied again and not made the final group and applied again and received it. And that's actually often been um, a good experience for them. They've enjoyed the people they've met as part of the, um, the interview process if they get to the interview stage. Um, and I think the experience of the committee is usually that every year they come back, they're stronger applicants. Um, so I think this is one of those cases where um, I would say that if you think you might um, uh, sort of meet the kind of criteria that the committee is interested in, there's only one way to find out. So apply early and apply often. Um, and I'd really, I'd really encourage you. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, it just occurred to me, nobody asked about the interview. Um, does anybody have any so if you did get selected to be the final nine or ten and you went for an interview, does anybody have any questions about that? Or, or 
simply if, wait and if find you get, out. If you get to that stage, you can email Murray or me for advice, yes. and we can give you what tips there are to be given. Okay. <laughs> Good luck, you. everyone. Great to see you.